Hello. In this video, we are going to discuss the Pauli exclusion principle. Again, from the point of view of anti-symmetry. In a previous video, we showed, starting with the principle that fermions have anti-symmetric wave functions, that two electrons with the same spin cannot be in the same place at the same time. In this video, we are going to look at the case of two electrons with opposite spins and whether the Pauli principle prevents them from being in the same place at the same time. Recall that we can define two different spin functions. The first we call alpha, and we say that we have the function alpha of one means that electron number one has an up spin. So we can represent this graphically sometimes as showing an arrow pointing up. We can also think of this as having a value of m sub s for the angular, the spin angular momentum of the electron having a value of plus one half. We can also define a second function, which we call beta. And when we have beta of one, this is in terminology we would call an electron with a down spin. And we represent this graphically as an arrow pointing down. And this is equivalent to having a quantum number m sub s of minus one half. So we're going to use this um, terminology quite a bit in what follows. Suppose that we have two electrons. So now we want to look at the possible combinations of electron spin for the two electrons. The first is where we have both the first and the second electron are both up. So sometimes you can represent this as two up spins. And in this case, since now we're talking about more than one electron, we don't have small m sub s, but we have big m sub s. And we count each of these as a plus one half. So this gives us a value of plus one for big m sub s. Similarly, we could have both electrons be pointing down. So we have two down electrons, and we can represent this as two arrows pointing down. So in this case, the value of m sub s, since each one is down, it counts as a minus one half. So that gives us a total value of minus one for this combination of two electrons. So the final two combinations, it does not seem at first like it would be tricky. We have a situation where we have one electron up and one electron down. But it's going to be slightly more complicated because of the fact that electrons are indistinguishable particles. So we end up with the interesting combination here of alpha of one, beta of two. So this is the first electron up is up and the second electron is down, plus alpha 2, beta of 1. And if we're uh, being very fastidious of writing the entire spin part of the wave function, we can use the fact that we have a normalization constant in front here, which would be 1 over the square root of 2. Um, putting in there to be extra fastidious about details, but for our further conversation, the fact that we have this particular uh, normalization constant won't be terribly important. So here we have a situation where we have one up and one down. So the overall m sub s here is going to be equal to zero. Over here is going to be equal to zero. So this looks weird in a sense because we have, it looks like the first electron. So doing our graphic thing here is we have a combination where we have the first one's up and the second one's down, plus a combination where the second one is down, the first, yeah, the, is down, and the second one is up. So we've switched which one's up and which one's down in each of these cases. So we have this linear combination of electron spins and it gives us the value that m sub s is equal to zero. Now, the three combinations that we've shown so far have something very, very important in common here. 
What they have in common is that if we swap the first and second electrons, so if I, instead of writing one, I write two, and wherever I write two, I write one, we notice that in each of those cases, the wave function does not change at all. It basically has the same exact sign that it would have before, so we say that it's symmetric with respect to interchange of two electrons. You notice if I switch one and two here, I would get beta two, beta one. There's no distinguishing order of writing the alpha or beta functions, so they commute. So uh, beta one times beta two is exactly the same as beta two times beta one. So we see that for the first two, it is symmetric with respect to swapping. Similarly with the third combination here, if I swap uh, the first and second electrons, this turns into alpha 2 plus beta 1, which is exactly this term. And if I swap 2, this becomes alpha 1, beta 2, which is the first term. So I get exactly the same result, just switched around on opposite sides of the plus sign, if I interchange the first and second electrons. So that tells us that all three of these combinations have the property that they are symmetric with respect to interchange of the um, to electrons. So this gives us a symmetric spin part to the overall wave function. We also might notice something else is that just as whenever I have angular momentum things, I have these m functions, that if I have the overall angular momentum L, for example, the possible values of L go from m sub L equals minus L up to m sub L equal positive L, we get the same situation for the spin. So if I have spin value goes from minus one to plus one, that tells me the overall value of spin capital S, so this is capital S here, is equal to plus one. So this is what we call a triplet state. And here we can see a further insight into why what's triple about it is that we have three different spin wave functions that contribute to this particular triplet state. So now we need the fourth combination, the fourth possibility, of arranging the spins of two electrons. And it will look very, very similar to this function. So let's look at it carefully. So we have the first electron is up and the second one is down. Or the other combination is that the second one is up and the first one is down. So, so far it looks exactly the same as the wave function that we had previously written as part of the triplet state. But now the difference here is that we have a negative sign. So the negative sign is going to make all the difference. The proper normalization constant would be 1 over the square root of 2, but like I said, that's a, uh, a detail that's not going to come up so much here. So it's going to look, when we write it graphically, very similar to this. We have the first electron up, the second one down, or the combination where the, um, the second one is up and the first one is down. So it looks very similar, except for the fact that we now have a minus sign instead of a plus sign. What about the value of m sub s here? Well, m sub s, for this first term, plus a half minus a half is zero. And here we have plus a half minus a half again. So again, here we have m sub s is going to be equal to zero. But this is the only term that is now anti-symmetric. If we swap the first and second electrons, we end up getting, the, we reverse these terms around. So we're gonna use a trick here that is a very useful trick, is that if I have the quantity a minus b and I take the negative of that, that gives me b minus a. And we notice the same thing with this particular combination. If I swap the first and second electrons, I'm going to get now alpha of 2 beta of 1 minus alpha of 1 beta 2, which is exactly what we have here, swapping the terms on opposite sides of the negative sign. So it shows that this really is anti-symmetric. It is distinguishable from the triplet state. So here we have where the value of s overall is equal to zero. So this is the singlet. In our previous discussion, when we had talked about the Pauli principle for two electrons with the same spin, what we were really talking about, even though we didn't mention it in detail in that particular video, is we were talking about a triplet state. So now we want to see how we apply the Pauli principle in the case where we have a singlet, where we have opposite spins. 
as we did in the previous video, we're going to make use of the fact that we can write the wave function for two electrons as a separable wave function, which means we can write it as the product of two different wave functions, one of which is entirely dependent upon the spatial part, and the other part, which is based upon the spin part. And we know overall, because we're talking about electrons, and this is always going to be true, that the overall wave function has to be anti-symmetric with respect to swapping two electrons. So there are two possible ways that we can generate this anti-symmetric wave function. We could do it by having a spatial part that's anti-symmetric and multiplying it by a spin part that's symmetric. Or we can do it by multiplying a spatial part that's symmetric times a spin part that is anti-symmetric. In either case, anti-symmetric times symmetric will give us an anti-symmetric wave function, which is required because electrons are fermions. And we've already found a suitable wave function, even though it was a complicated looking one, for the spin part of the two electron part, which we wrote as one over the square root of two. And then we have the alpha of one times beta of two minus alpha of two, beta of one, Remember, that is our singlet uh, wave function. And also recall that it is anti-symmetric. So what we're looking at is the case here to generate our overall wave function, where we're going to have the spin part be anti-symmetric, but it's going to require that we have a spatial part that is going to be symmetric. So can we write a convenient spatial part of the wave function for two electrons, such that is a symmetric wave function. Well, we already have a bit of a hint when we're looking at the spin parts of how you end up with a uh, symmetric part. So here we simply have, again, we have this normalization constant of one of the square root of two. So we can have the situation where in orbital A, the first electron resides, and the second electron resides in orbital B, or, we can have that the second electron is in orbital A and the first electron is in orbital B. And the key part that makes it symmetric is the plus sign. So notice that when we have these linear combinations, that conveniently the symmetric combination will be the plus sign, the anti-symmetric combination will be the minus sign. So with that, we're, we're now at the point where we're able to, and we'll do in the next slide, write the overall proper anti-symmetric wave function for two electrons with opposite spins, the singlet case. So here we have in gory detail, the overall proper wave function for two electrons in a singlet state where they have opposite spins. Here is the, in blue, we have our anti-symmetric spin part, and then in black we have our symmetric spatial part. What we're going to do next to make it look somewhat similar to the wave function that we had written in the um, paired spin case, so the triplet case, we're going to write this particular term as a determinant. So now we have the overall wave function written in the form of determinant times a expression here. So now the key point in the derivation that we had done previously for the same spin case. So when we have a phenomenon of an interaction between electrons with the same spin, we call that interaction exchange. The interaction between electrons of opposite spin is called correlation. Typically, uh, in the magnitude of the energy, the exchange interaction is about 10 times, on the whole, as large as the correlation interaction, which led many researchers to assume that if you could correctly calculate the exchange in a chemical system, that was all that was necessary. It turns out that the differences in energy that occur during a chemical reaction are so small 
that even though correlation is a small part of the overall energy, it's a big part of the difference in energies during a chemical reaction. So that a key to accurate calculation of uh, chemical reactions by computational chemistry is getting both the exchange and the correlation interactions um, done as accurately as possible. So here we have this. So the typical trick that we would do now in the same spin case would be to assume that the two orbitals go to the same place at the same time. So basically saying that the orbital number one basically converges to orbital number two. So this means that the two orbitals essentially fuse into one um, so that the electrons in those orbitals are forced to go to the same place at the same time. And when we're doing the case of the paired spins, of the spins that go in the same direction, the result of this was to have an effect upon the determinant to make the determinant equal to zero. By making the determinant equal to zero, it made the overall wave function equal to zero, which was a contradiction because it told us that there were no electrons present, which we know is not true because we started assuming that we had two electrons. Well, in this case, let's see what happens when we do the same thing, where we bring the two orbitals together. Well, now the orbitals are involved in this particular expression, which has a plus sign. So bringing A to B does not make this expression go to zero. Far from it. Basically, it just turns it into um, double one of the other expressions. So as long as this expression already is not zero, after we converge these together, this expression is still not going to be zero. Does it have any effect upon the determinant? No, because the determinant here only involves the spins. So we're not flipping the spins, we're bringing one orbital to the other one. So the result is that by bringing these two orbitals together, I have not set my wave function to zero. Therefore, there is no contradiction in this particular step. So it seems from anti-symmetry that there is nothing to keep two electrons so long as they have opposite spins from being in the same place at the same time. And in fact, we make use of this fact when we stick two electrons in the same orbital in general chemistry. Now, there is a subtle point here in the fact that we know because electrons have charge that the electron-electron repulsion would become very, very large if we tried to bring two electrons to the exact same point in space. So, but as far as the anti-symmetry of the fermions, that does not impose any restrictions at all on bringing two electrons together so long as they have opposite spins. I thank you very much for your attention. As always, have a good one.